we've changed this talk. We, actually, I was really impressed with Mark's talk because you did your talk way in advance of when we did our talk, because you did it yesterday, and we mostly did it about 20 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> It's, it's changed a lot. It, it, I, I, was, um, I was very lucky to be here last year with my, my wife, Susan Elderkin, who's a, a bibliotherapist, so she prescribes novels for ailments instead of medicine. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's amazing how many of the talks that we've had already this morning very much feed into what Topson and I want to talk about, which is why we slightly revised it. It's, it's, it's almost as though someone planned a conference where speakers would get together and feed off of each other's ideas. Doubt that was the case. <coughs> So I'm a neurologist. I, I'm, um, I really love being a neurologist because it's, uh, it, it's an act of... It's, 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 a, it's the profession, I think, in medicine, to me, that focuses very much on the physical exam and the use of the physical exam and diagnosis. So um, it, it's what's drawn me to the field. It's that, it's that really careful... And, 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 and Suzanne, I think... Is, is Suzanne still here? Oh, there you are. I mean, I, I think this should be a neurology meeting, basically. Um, because it's that, I, I do think that all of the speakers we've had today have that same love of noticing small things, really small things. And I was, I was also born, I was born in Dayton, Ohio, not very far from where Mark was born. And I never thought, growing up in southwest Ohio, that either of us would be at a place talking about medicine and art in, in this kind of creative way. I mean, we grew up in a really industrial area. Um, but that act of looking at things in a very small and subtle way is, is one of the reasons that I think Buddhists and neuroscientists um, have so much in common, because what I do is look at, uh, fr from the outside in, looking at a patient and trying to uh, establish a diagnosis with careful observation. And I think, Tupton, what you do is look from the inside at, at, uh, at mental life very carefully. So I want to um, mention the book, because Ruby would be very upset if we didn't mention the book. We're... we're <laughs> We're really, we're really excited to be here because Ruby never lets us talk about the things we want to talk about. <laughs> She's, first of all, we talk, Tupton, Tupton really likes to talk about um, reducing the ego. When, when, you, when you do a book with Ruby Wax, <coughs> that's a difficult topic. We, we, li we like talking about the diminution of the self, which we're never allowed to talk about. Um, I like talking about neurochemistry and statistics. Never allowed to talk about that. Um, my, my, my path to, 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 to doing this project with Tupton and Ruby, I mean, I started out doing, um, doing molecular biology, so it's a, it's a long way away um, for me. And, and I still have the inclination to be really skeptical about what we're doing. So that's one of the things that I want to talk about um, today. But I think what, you know, one, one of the things I'd li I told Ronan that I'd like to do is, is, is kind of respond to some of the talks that have happened. Yeah. This morning, so Suzanne, your, your talk this morning, um, I thought you said something really interesting about, uh, for, for those of you who weren't here, it was, it was about functional neurological disorders, and you had a really interesting comment about maybe functional neurological disorders are disorders of attention, and specifically disorders of the way in which people attention, pay attention to their bodies. And it made me think about some of the things that we've talked about um, in the book. Yeah, in, 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 the, in our work together, we talk a lot about um, training and developing awareness and a different quality of awareness than the awareness we use in an academic or intellectual sense. So it's more a sort of direct perception of the moment without judging or thinking about it, but a very direct link. And that's what meditation is about. Right, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little... I, I, I do get to show you a little bit of data, which I'm excited about. But I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit of data about the uh, parts of the brain that are involved in paying attention to the self, yeah. and, and particularly paying attention to pathology in the self. Uh, you know, largely, we're talking about parts of the brain like the cingulate cortex and the insular cortex. And it may, it may be that one way to think about functional neurological disorders is a, 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 a disorder of the, of the connectivity or, or effective connectivity between those regions. Um, these are patients who are responding to bodily threats when there are no bodily threats. Uh, and I think that's something meditation really it's, it does change. I'm going to show yeah. you some, some evidence for that. Um, and then Rachel, where's is Rachel? Oh, hi, Rachel. So you were talking, I thought it was, you, you know, you were, you're so motivated by compassion. And, the, and, and one of the things that we talk about a lot is compassion, compassion versus empathy, mm. and compassion as the ability to act. Mm. And you, Rachel, and, and compassion fatigue, which is something that you're working on right now in Galway. Yeah, so, so 
the difference between empathy and compassion where empathy is, you feel what the other people feel, but to me, sometimes that feels a bit like you're drowning also. I think we talked about how, as a doctor, you can't walk into the room of a patient and burst into tears right. and say, you know, I'm so sorry that you're dying. You, you, the compassion is where you are, uh, you're acting to help others. And I think Ash was talking, uh, you, you were talking a while ago about how when somebody does compassion meditation, the areas of the brain connected to intention to act are activated. Right, so there's actually, that's a very interesting study, which is not in this talk, but, but basically the study shows that when you, um, when you do compassion meditation versus relaxation therapy, you get activation in the premotor cortex. So it's, a, it's an area of the brain that's involved in preparing motor action. So even without the actual act of pre preparing a real motor action, compassion seems to involve this preparation to act. Whatever it is in the brain that develops a a potential of a, a, a kind of a readiness to act is, is activated. Because what, one of the things Ruby said to me was, um, so I, I went into retreat for four years, I locked myself away, meditating all day for four years. She said, what's that got to do with helping anybody? You're just sitting, um, and this is what monks do, we sit in caves and we go to retreats and we talk about compassion, but then we lock ourselves away. And what I tried to explain is that during those four years, you're training yourself in building the compassion networks in your brain. So, as Ash mentioned, when you're meditating on compassion, you're strengthening those areas of your brain which can help you then act in a positive way in the world. So when you come out of retreat, you are serving and helping others. And so my interest is around how we are all naturally compassionate people, especially people in the medical profession, but can you build that and strengthen that and stabilize that and reduce the kind of ego part of that so that it can become more expansive and more useful. And this was something, so I'm, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really bad at meditating and I'm not great at compassion. Um, luckily, doing this book with Ruby, it's been challenging for both of us in, in different ways, for different reasons, but she's really bad at compassion as well. <laughs> and so at least we have that in common. We can kind of talk about the fact that that's a word all of those words, like meditation and compassion, they feel really gooey. You yeah. know, they feel like uh, insubstantial things. Um, so that's been a struggle, but it, it's been an interesting process doing it with Ruby because she forces both you and I to ask really difficult questions. She does. She, she, she does. forces you to d deal with the gooey. Yeah. And yeah. she forces me to deal with, with like <laughs> really simple questions for a neurologist, like what is a thought? That was um, the first question. That was the she first question us. she asked me. So we, we arrive at her breakfast table, and the question is, "What is a thought?" Yeah. To so him and me, and, I, and I that's how the book started. Right. That's right. chapter one, right. thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, 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 Peter, I want to talk about your performance because the what, what was so remarkable. I was sitting over there and watching your hands as you played, uh, and it really. I was. I turned to talk to and I said, "This is this is kind of this this non doing." that Buddhists talk a lot about. You, you cannot be moving your hands with that level of precision while thinking about what you're doing. On the other hand, no one would say that was an unconscious act. It's not a reflex. I mean, it is a conscious act, it's volitional, but there's something between, right? There's something between a volitional act and something where you're actively doing. There's this kind of, what, what would you, is that non-doing? It's kind of like the flow, you, uh, so performers, I work with a lot of musicians and actors, and there's that moment where you, you basically get out of your own way and you're in the moment and you are able to flow without thinking, but you're not sort of brain dead, you're conscious, but your, your thoughts move to one side and you're just being in that, in that space. Right, and, and there's, some, uh, there's really interesting research showing the shift in, in learned skills and particularly in meditation, you shift from a prefrontal dominant kind of conscious effort, really, and, and with meditation, <laughs> at least for me, I, I think with a lot of people, but it, it's huge amounts of effort, and to shift to this kind of effortless, I was noticing also your performance, you, you were hearing yourself play, I mean, you're sort of monitoring how it sounds, that beautiful Steinway piano that you're playing, right, it's a, you, you're, you're almost watching yourself do the thing that you're doing, so it's a, it's a really interesting, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting state. And I think, Mark, I mean, that coming back to yours, it absolutely, like this, your, your talk ended with us in the, very much in the present moment. Um, and that feeling of not reacting to 
disappointment, not reacting to emotional disappointment. And there's, there's a specific brain circuitry that I think meditation trains that has to do exactly with that process. Um, it was interesting in your talk because it's not just that you didn't react to, I guess, failures or emotional stressors, but you were ac acutely aware of them. I mean, it, it, you didn't pretend that they weren't there and you weren't immune to them. You know, you've, you felt them and you didn't judge them. I guess that's, to, to, to use the language yeah. that you so, let me, let me show a couple of things here, because I think um, I'm, I'm really skeptical about meditation. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I think there, there, there's really, there's some excellent research out there. Um, but research in meditation has, I think, basically four categories of serious limitations, and I'm, I'm not sure um, how to deal with them. So one of those um, is, is that there are different types of meditations. Uh, maybe, you, can, can you name some of the things? Like people talk about things like loving kindness meditation and... Yeah, this is the thing. How are you going to monitor, uh, how are you going to research meditation when there's so many different styles of meditation? And um, there's meditation where you're just being present. There's meditation with loving kindness and compassion. There's uh, stages of meditation. I mean, everybody knows, you know, meditation is where you focus on your breathing, but there's much more to it than that. There are 84,000 techniques. So are you going to research them all? You know, right, and, then, and yeah. then how do you compare across studies that look with different techniques? And even within the same technique, there's, there's, there's some evidence in the field that um, the, the way that you instruct subjects to do a particular meditative practice, yeah. the language that you use, yeah. if you want someone to do compassion meditation, yeah. the language you use to say, what should you be doing when you're sitting in the scanner? That language matters a lot in terms Completely. of what they actually do. So there was, there was some research done in Germany where there were two groups, and one group was led by a teacher who was told, actually just tell the people that when their mind wanders, bring their attention back to their breath, which is not actually the right way to teach meditation. The second group were told, tell the uh, meditator when your mind wanders, gently and compassionately bring your mind back to your breath. And there were huge differences in the results. So a lot of it is to do with suggestion as well. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly, exactly. Okay, so one is that we, we have to collapse across different types of meditation. And, and by types, I also mean a lot of these studies collapse across the number of lifetime hours that you practice. I mean, Peter, you know, like the number of lifetime hours that a pianist plays piano really affects performance. And, and, and someone just starting out, you know, having, having played piano, even having been a doctor for six months, that's really different than six years, right? So you can't collapse across those kinds of conditions. And uh, then you also have, uh, are you researching secular mindfulness, right. or are you researching something with a more spiritual inclination that will have very different effects in the brain and the body. So it's very hard to decide what you're going to research in terms of meditation. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so problem number two, there is no such thing as sham meditation. Um, this, <laughs> this is really tricky. What's an active control for a meditation trial? Um, there are some, I mean, people have tried different things. So there, there, people have tried um, relaxation therapy. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll do a, 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 med, a mindfulness session here at the end. But Which one Ash of, is going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to last about 10 seconds. <laughs> um, but one of the things you talk about is, you know, you, 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 will you tell people to ground themselves in the body? Or yeah, yeah. So how are you going to make them do it wrong? Because you can't actually <laughs> meditate wrong. In fact, we're all meditating wrong until we're meditating right. right. So... What is the control? What's and the critical how, how, do you do, how do you get somebody to do it in the wrong way? Right. I'm meditating in the wrong way because that's what we do until we find the right way. I've been to talk to you about that, actually. I noticed that. <laughs> um, so, 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 it, so it may be that the, I think the best solution to this so far is that you don't give people cognitive control instructions. So you give them the relaxation techniques, the breathing, but you don't tell them to do anything about the mind wandering. And that's one solution that's come up in the literature. I think yeah. that's probably the best, yeah. um, the best so far. Okay, the third one is obvious. Um, n you know, novices are not experts. Uh, and, and, and this has to do with experimental design. So if you want to test the effects of meditation on the brain, and you look at someone like Tupton, who's been practicing mindfulness meditation for 25 years, including crazy things like four years in a silent retreat, I mean, things that would drive me completely insane. And, and, and it, it may be that Tupton and I are already different. Going into this, he's able to do those things, and I'm maybe unable to do those things, and maybe that difference was present at birth. There's something about our brains that was already different. So when we look at, you know, if, if, if we look at a, um, 
at, at a cross-sectional study where you look at meditators versus non-meditators, there's a self-selection bias there. You see, ma many people I know who are really into meditation describe that when they were children, they found themselves naturally mm. slipping into a kind of meditational state. So it's almost that they had a propensity from birth to be that kind of person. Right. You right. hear about this a lot. So that's yeah. a potential complaint. Yeah. On, on, on the other hand, if you look at a longitudinal study and you take people who are novices who've never meditated and you train them in a mindfulness technique, uh, you don't see this effect of years and years of practice. Maybe a lot of the things that happen with meditation are, are long-term goals. Maybe, maybe they're not three-month or five-month goals, but maybe they're goals that happen over several years. And there is pretty good evidence that some of the really important changes in the brain uh, take years to develop. Some of them do happen within weeks or, or, or months. And my, my last concern that keeps me up at night is that uh, scientists, li scientists like to get published. And if you spend much time looking at research on meditation, it makes you really want to do meditation, and, which is completely understandable. And, and so you, when you look at a lot of the studies that are done on meditation, they're done by people who are passionate about meditation. So that's a little bit already a position of advocacy. Um, the other thing is that it, it, meditation studies are affected by, in the same ways that a lot of studies on these kinds of topics. And one of the problems is that the studies are relatively small, 12 to 20 people is a normal study size. Um, and, and the other problem is that because of the way scientific publishing works, there's a bias to publish positive findings. So if you do a meditation study and you don't see an effect on chronic pain, that's very unlikely to get published. In fact, it's very unlikely to get submitted for publication, let alone published. So there's a, little, there, there's a bias there in, in, in the literature. Um, so these are things that I lose sleep over. You guys don't, luckily. We don't care. Um, <laughs> we know it works. But, but, that, <laughs> but that said... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I don't know. I think that's it. I think it's important. I think the phenomenological side of this is really um, is really significant. So there are there are really cool phenomena that happen with meditation. But let me let me first um, just take you through a little bit of some some structural changes, just so we've sort of seen them. This is a table. Um, oh, sorry, I'm seeing it on mine, and you're not seeing it on yours. Um, this is a table from. Uh, Michael Posner's group, the, the, the Tang and Posner, have done a lot of really beautiful studies on structural changes in the brain uh, that, that occur as a result of meditation. So you can see there's a long list here of um, meditative practices on the left, uh, the control conditions that were used, sample sizes, the type of measurement, that's one of the biases that we didn't talk about. How do you look for brain changes that result from meditation? So you could pick techniques like fMRI, EEG, ERPs, you can look at gray matter, you can look at white matter. Uh, it's, it's not, we don't have a standard as to what the change we expect to see should be. Uh, so there's a wide variety of changes that we see. A couple things in this uh, table are, are significant. You'll see over and over that meditation tends to really affect the insula. In that study, the, in particular, the right anterior insula. The insular cortex is a part of the brain that we can say is responsible for body monitoring. It certainly responds to bodily damage, and it connects the brain with, uh, in part, it connects the brain with the autonomic nervous system. It also does a lot of interceptive monitoring, so it's responsible for changes in heart rate. Um, the, the cingulate cortex comes up over and over, and in particular the anterior cingulate cortex. The, that's a part of the, it's one of the midline structures in the brain that relates the limbic system, or the emotional parts of the brain, to uh, cognitive control systems in the frontal lobe. So that's, that's probably the most significant change that happens in meditation. And the corona radiata, really all of these um, midline frontal white matter structures are changed, and, and some in some pretty profound ways. So those are structural changes. If you're just looking at structural MRI for changes, those are the kinds of changes that people tend to see. There are some functional, let's say functional connectivity changes. Um, again, lots of different studies, lots of different brain regions, and these are looking generally at uh, cross-sectional studies of, of uh, people who've been meditating for decades, pe people like Tupton. Uh, again, some of the major regions, the anterior cingulate cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala are regions that come up a lot when you look at uh, comparative studies of, uh, of functional changes in meditation. So I, I wanted to just mention a couple, and then mm. I want to hear you, your thoughts on mm. right, like why, um, why these things matter. So one, one interesting study is um, this Tomasino et al. study from 2012. And this study shows, uh, it was a study looking at 275 people 
uh, and looking at both novice and expert meditators. And they used a method, um, uh, it's a meta-analysis paper actually, and they used a method called, uh, it's called act the activation likelihood estimate. It's basically a way of combining data in a meta-analysis and um, figuring out which parts of the brain were likely to be activated across all the, all the studies using a, a, a bunch of different conditions. So one of the things that was really interesting in the study is that there was a shift from the medial prefrontal cortex, which we know is really active in cognitive control tasks. So it's active in tasks like the, the Stroop task, for those of you who are familiar um, with a conflict task. where The Stroop task is the test where you see a word, uh, uh, which is the name of a color, like the word red, but it will be written in green ink, and you have to name the color of the ink. So there's a conflict, an informational conflict, and you have to suppress the conflict to respond quickly. So the medial prefrontal cortex is involved in tasks like that. And in this study, Tomasino showed pretty convincingly that in experienced meditators, there's a shift in conflict resolution, there's a shift in activation from the medial prefrontal cortex uh, to the striatum, uh, the basal ganglia, actually the caudate and putamen, and probably mostly the putamen. So this is kind of what I was thinking about doing your performance, Peter, that there's this shift from a very effortful, what happens to me when I try to meditate, which is incredibly effortful. You're constantly reminding your mind to not do what it's supposed to do. And it's, it's kind of exhausting. It can be, but it, that's a lot to do with attitude because I think there's a big uh, misconception amongst people that when you meditate, you're supposed to stop your thoughts. And the effort... I mean, people are sitting there with sweat dripping down their faces yeah. trying to stop their thoughts. That's not the point. But many people fall into that trap of... And, and you, you started meditating with me when we started the book, and you said it was exhausting. Oh, I felt, yeah, no, it was, it, strange things happened to me, which I didn't, I didn't expect. You found it exhausting because you were trying to switch, switch off those thoughts. Yeah. And then I, tr I explained to Ash that thoughts are great, there's nothing wrong with them, but you want to choose to just ch take your attention away from the thought and back to your breath... And that's an easy thing to do. There's no effort. You just do that, and then the mind flies off again, and then you bring it back. It flies off again. You bring it back. There's no effort in that. The effort is if you think you're supposed to stop thinking. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've been friends for two years, and I'm still doing that wrong. <laughs> But that, what you're describing is cognitive control, and yeah, that's, yeah. That's, a, that's a characteristically prefrontal task. Yeah. So it's interesting that that task, which is really a prefrontal task, um, shifts to be a, a basal ganglia task in experienced meditators. And I think that's one of the really significant hallmark differences of what meditation actually uh, is. So the next study um, I want to talk about is this uh, Tang et al. in Proceedings of the National Academy in 2009. Um, the anterior cingulate is really where it's at in terms of meditation. It's, a, it's an interesting structure in the brain. Um, it's re, it, it, has a, it projects widely across the brain. It's involved in a lot of regulation between, let's say, higher cognition or cognitive control mechanisms, emotional regulation, and, and autonomic features as well. Tang et al. looked at 80 undergraduates, and they did five days. I don't know what this is. It's, it's called integrated mind-body training. Integrated mind-body training? Yeah. It's a meditative practice. See, this is always the trouble. They were probably doing the body scan. They yeah. were probably uh, getting the person to focus their attention on parts of their body. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the most classic method used in research, I think. Right, right. Yeah. So, but, but the nice thing in, in this study is that they contrasted this to a relaxation technique, where they basically had the person relax their body using a kind of like that where you start at the feet and you relax your muscles progressively going tensing up to... Tensing and then relaxing. Tensing and relaxing. Mm -hmm. Which isn't okay. so useful. Right. Yeah. So, and what, what, uh, what Tang et al. Saw, saw in the study is that this was... It, it, in, in general, the anterior cingulate is the, is the most consistently linked to changes uh, in the brain after meditation. The meditators that they did, and remember, this was just five days. It's only five days of meditation training in people who've never done it. But the people who did the five days of meditation training were able to recruit uh, the anterior cingulate more in tasks where they had to do emotional regulation. So they had to respond to pictures that were unpleasant. Um, and they had to kind of had a, they had a fearful response or an angry response, and they had to try to suppress that response. The anterior cingulate is, is interesting in another way. Um, the anterior cingulate cortex has two, there's sort of two bits of it. There's a dorsal bit uh, at the top, which does conflict resolution, like the, the Stroop task. And there's a ventral bit at the, at, the, at the bottom there, which is more connected to limbic, limbic and autonomic structures. And it turns out that those two bits of the brain, they, they tend to suppress each other. So if you have a high level of emotional arousal, 
that the dorsal part of the anterior cingulate becomes suppressed and you're less able to do conflict resolution tasks. And, and, and that makes sense with our normal experience. Basically, if, you're really, if you get emotionally aroused, that sounds really inappropriate. In this <laughs> I mean that in a technical way. Um, you know, if you get worked up about something, it's very hard to focus on cognitive problems. It's hard to focus on tasks where you really need, to, you, you need your brain to do something. Yeah. And, and so I think when somebody meditates regularly, what they're, teach, what they're learning to do is how to let go of a mind state that you don't want to be trapped in and move yourself into a different mind state. So it's nothing to do with blocking the thoughts. It's entirely about choosing where you put your mind, where you put your focus, and when you take your focus away from a negative mind state, that goes away too. Right. It doesn't wait on a shelf for you to come back to it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's interesting because I think this, this feature, I mean, having, having done this really badly, but having done it with you for mm. a couple of years now, mm. I have found there are real differences in, in my life. Mm. I mean, in basic things, like we, we both have had stressful situations recently, and I think a, a little bit more than before, mm. I was able to be in that really stressful situation and watch the stress build up mm. and just be aware that that mm. was happening. Mm. And that, that somehow made a, made, a, made a big difference. So I, I'm speculating, but I think that that's, a, that's an anterior cingulate effect. But, you know, when we think about stress, the famous player is the amygdala. Um, Holtz et al. did this beautiful study in PNA, uh, PNAS in 2013 where they looked at connectivity between the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex in patients with generalized anxiety disorder. So these were uh, 20, 20, I think they did 26 patients that were diagnosed um, with GID and they had eight weeks of uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which yeah. is John Kabat-Zinn's yeah. technique, um, versus a stress management training program. So they had a, an, a, an anti-anxiety program already in place. And they, were, uh, they compared these, these two groups, so M MBSR versus stress management. And, the, and the, the patients in the study were shown either neutral or angry faces. And it turns out that if you take people with generalized anxiety disorder and you show them threatening or angry faces, they have a threat response. So they, they have a, a certain level of anxiety. So after these eight weeks of meditation, um, Holtzel et al. compared these two groups. And they found really interesting uh, crossing trends. For those of you who do um, any kind of behavioral or cognitive science, you know that like when, the, when, when, two, when two slopes cross, it's very exciting. It's an interaction effect. And the two slopes that crossed in this condition were um, in, in patients who had done the stress reduction technique only, every time their amygdala was active, this is a little complicated, so I'll go slow. Every, every time the amygdala was active in naive patients, their prefrontal cortex would be less active. So the threat response in the amygdala would suppress the prefrontal cortex. That's the normal response that probably happens in all of us. It definitely happens in patients with generalized anxiety disorder. So after eight weeks of the mindfulness-based stress reduction training program, there was exactly the opposite effect. So in those patients, when there was amygdala activation in response to threatening pictures, there was more activation of prefrontal cortex, which means those patients were able to recruit cognitive control mechanisms to regulate what the amygdala was doing. And that had a, a knock-on effect in terms of influence on the autonomic signs like galvanic skin response. Uh, but also, it, it, was the, it was the best predictor of the patient's self-reported uh, decrease in anxiety after, uh, after both training programs. So there was a really strong correlation with the degree to which the slope flipped and the, and the symptom reduction in the patient. So it seems reasonable to speculate that that might be a mechanism of the, of the symptom reduction. And I think the, the key point here is it's a training program because I, I, I meet a lot of people who say to me, okay, give me a method I can use when I'm stressed. Right. Like, I'm going to keep this up my sleeve, and then when, when my boss is shouting at me, I'm going to pull it out. It doesn't work. Yeah. You, you've got to train, just like you've got to go to the gym and lift weights. And so if you do these training programs, you are, you're, learn, you're, you're teaching your brain how to behave differently. You can't just switch it on. Right, yeah. and this is, what, this is, in a way, it's one, of the, it's one of the difficult things that I think as physicians we would face in recommending these kinds of programs as, as therapies because to patients. Because it's hard work. It's hard work yeah. and it takes a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't take, I don't think it takes resources. No. Um, but it takes a lot of time. So this is, it's one of the challenges. Okay, so the next study um, is uh, Judson Brewer, who, 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 was, who was at Yale at the time that he did this study um, in PNAS in 2011. And Brewer studied um, 
the, the, the default mode network, which is basically the set of midline structures in the brain uh, that's been associated with mind-wandering, self-referential thinking. By, by default mode, what cognitive scientists mean is that it's sort of what patients do, it's what subjects do in a, in a functional imaging scanner when they're not specifically doing anything else, which is they tend to evaluate their own performance in the scanner, they tend to think about their shopping, they tend to think about how noisy and irritating it is, and uh, like everyone in this room, they're starting to think, well, when is lunch coming? Is it pretty soon? Those are default mode, um, mode activities. So uh, Brewer looked at 12, 12 subjects who had had a lot of mindfulness practice, more than 10 years of mindfulness practice. He compared those 12 subjects with 13 untrained subjects, uh, and he gave them instructions. He print, actually, not nicely in Brewer's paper, he actually prints the instructions that he gave, um, the, the specific instru the wording that he used. But he, he, he instructs them in, again, like things like choiceless awareness. What is choiceless awareness? Never heard of it. Okay. Choice, choiceless awareness, he kind of basically describes that as, um, as being aware of, of bringing your mind back, I think, but without choosing. There was some, it, some there's language a huge amount of choice. I don't know why he's called it choiceless. It he should called, be he choiceful. He called it choiceless. You, you, you're not supposed to be critical of people like that. You're supportive. We're compassionate. He got it, he got it wrong. We're compassionate it's, it's, about his, his choice about choiceless. <laughs> Um, so choiceless awareness, and then he, he did loving kindness, which yeah. you, you mentioned, yeah. and then concentration on breath, which the instruction there was purely to um, bring your attention back to your breathing. Okay, um, so with choiceless awareness, I think what he's talking about is you're not doing it, you're not focusing on a technique such as your breath. You're just in the present moment. Right. It's called object-free meditation, where you just sit and are present, and you're not choosing to return to something. You're just being. It's much more advanced. So, oh, so now it's advanced. A minute ago. Yeah. <laughs> so he's using three quite advanced techniques because he was working with people who've done yeah. more than 10 years. And yeah. 13 people like me yeah. who had no idea what they're doing. Um, anyway, it turns out if you com contrast 13 idiots with 13 Zen monks, um, <laughs> what, what you get, it, interestingly, is... Um, is a dramatic reduction in the default mode network. So the default mode network in all of us tends to switch off when, we're, when, we, um, when we become task engaged. So it's, it's, it's kind of considered a, a task irrelevant network versus a task relevant network. So when you start doing a thing, the default mode network shuts down and your brain starts do, uh, you, devoting resources to doing these other things. And then the minute you stop doing a task, the default mode network comes back. It, in the Zen meditators, um, sorry, it wasn't Zen meditators, it was, it was, a, it was collapsed across multiple, uh, multiple kinds of mindfulness practice. But in the meditators, the, their default mode network tended to not switch on, and particularly it tended to not switch on in the posterior, the posterior cingulate cortex, uh, in the precuneus area, and the medial prefrontal cortex. So the, 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 the conclusion from that change is that the reduction that the meditators had in a sort of self-awareness, the mind wandering, that correlated with a reduction in these midline structures that we know are really associated with kind of egocentric thinking and, and mind wandering. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, the, the, only, thing, the, only, the only other thing I wanted to say about this. That's pretty. It's very pretty. I like it. Um, it has nothing to do with meditation. But it's, um, it's the idea that when we talk about findings in neuroscience and, and, and findings in terms of brain structure, you know, it's really, it's really easy to want to talk about, like, oh, this area gets bigger, mm. this area gets stronger. Mm. I mean, I'm excited about the anterior cingulate in terms of meditation. Mm. But the brain doesn't really work like a, in, in a series of areas like that. The brain works in, in networks, and it works in passing information across networks. So what's important in terms of changes in the brain is what we would normally call effective connectivity. So how well does one region of the brain talk to another region of the brain. Because I think generally people in, in the popular sense talk about meditation making your brain almost like taking it to the gym and it yeah. becomes more buff. Right. But it's not really that, is it? You're talking about connections rather than right. physical changes in growth or thicker areas. I mean, what, what are yeah, you I'm talking not, I'm about? Not talking, I'm not talking about thicker areas. And I'm not even necessarily talking about physically observable changes in, mm. in white matter, which mm. you could think of as thicker areas. But what I'm talking about is the ability of neurons in one part of the brain to activate neurons or mm. suppress neurons in another part of the brain, mm. the, effect, the, the effectiveness of that mm. kind of connection. And there's, there's um, you know, to, to kind of go, go back to how, how this could happen, how can, how can meditation make the brain change in these ways? Which, mm. you know, from, from my background as a biologist, that seems disturbing to me, that, that it should happen at such a profound level. Um, Michael Posner has proposed a really interesting theory, 
which I'll just basically walk you through because I'm excited about it. Uh, and the, the, the idea is basically that um, he, he's shown, it, it, he and Tang have both shown in the uh, late, t in, in, in 2009, 2010, that meditation causes changes in the anterior cingulate cortex. And we already talked about that. It tends to cause uh, a, 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 an increase in theta power in the anterior cingulate cortex. And, and, and that just means low frequency oscillations that you can find in EEG. If you localize the source, they tend to be localized around the anterior cingulate cortex. So you get this increase in theta power. They've also shown that if you have an increase in theta power in the anterior cingulate in mice, which you can induce by sticking an electrode in and just causing electrical pulsations at theta frequencies, let's say sort of seven, seven hertz or something like that. Um, if you do that in mice, you get activation of a, of a specific protease called calpane. That protease activates a specific population of oligodendrocytes, which are the cells in the brain that make myelin. They, they, they cause this connectivity. This is completely Greek to me, but it sounds well, good. It's <laughs> cool. It's cool because what it means is that there's a, there's a kind of a mechanism. We can imagine a mechanism that meditation causes these changes in the prefrontal cortex. It causes the effort of, medit of, of the effort yeah. of mind wandering to shift to basal ganglia structures. It causes effective connectivity with the anterior cingulate cortex. It does that by causing theta rhythms for whatever reason, these low frequency oscillations, which has a specific protease and a specific population of glial cells that get activated. So I, I find that incredibly comforting. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, my take on all of this is that all of this research has, made, has put meditation on the map. So, of course, in the East, it's been popular for centuries, but now in the West, because you can prove it works scientifically, more people are doing it. I mean, I've noticed over the last 10 years, more and more people are coming to classes from all walks of life. It's no longer the... You know, when I started meditating, it was hippies and Buddhists. That was it. Now it's people in Google, it's people in hospitals, it's schools. So it's because of Benedict. this stuff. Yeah, so it's, well, he's, he, he is a Buddhist, so that's different. But th this, this, is, this is making it mainstream. It, science has proved it's right, so it works, and so that's why people are doing it. And I think, I mean, everything you've said is great, but we also need to find a way to make this into bite-sized chunks of information that people can understand. That's kind of what Ruby does. Yeah. She kind of dumbs down the science in a way to make it palatable. I think that's clever. So there needs to be kind of a middle way between the supercharged information and the uh, version that we can understand. But that is what's making it popular. Well, I'll tell you, and, and, and I think in terms of the experience of doing this book, you, you, oh, did you, you had a great story about Ruby getting people to do mindfulness in a big room. What story? At one, of, one of her talks, she got people to do mindfulness. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 reason I wanted, the reason I started to work with Ruby was because I was so inspired. I went to one of her, she does these, these stand-up comedy shows, and I went to one where there was, you know, 3,000 people in the audience, and she's making them laugh, and she's giving them great jokes, and then she gets them to meditate. And you've got all these people from all walks of life who never, ever would meditate, sitting up and doing it, and... Yeah. It's amazing to see how she's able to communicate that to people. I found yeah, it very, and very and inspiring. I think, I think one of the um, one of the things that's really a relief about the book is I, I think, and I think Mark, you hit upon that in your talk, which is that if you if something's funny, you know, if we like when we laugh with you at your at your talk, there there's a moment. It's it, there's an interesting thing about theory of mind at that point. I, I think there's there's it feels very much that when you share a laugh with someone, you are mentally in exactly the same place that they are. It's not approximately the same place. It's precisely the same place. And it may be the only time when we communicate with each other that I can be certain of what you're thinking because we laughed at the mm. same thing. Almost every other thing that we say, you don't really know what's going on in someone else's mind and how they're taking it. But when you laugh, you are. And I think that's a thing that we found through the book, that somehow putting this in the language of comedy, mm. taking something really po faced like neurobiology and, and meditation, mm. which are often so boring. Kind of serious and boring, mm. right? <laughs> So no, I mean, um, we give really boring talks in universities. <laughs> and so to do this through comedy was a, a very challenging for us, but oh, also God. incredibly powerful because of what you're saying, that we discovered you can communicate these deep wisdoms through a medium that everybody will understand. Right. You make people laugh, and then you drop in some wisdom. It's quite incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think basically what we're saying is, first of all, 
be you should funny. buy the book. Be funny. Be, be <laughs> funny. <laughs> buy the book. I, I do. I do. I, I do actually quite genuinely feel that these approaches are broadly useful in medicine. They're, yeah. they're certainly useful to the kinds of issues we've talked about this morning um, in the talks. But I think it, the, the difficulty, and, and I think maybe maybe everyone here can contribute to that. But I mean, the difficulty is how do you talk to patients about it? How do you incorporate these techniques into your own life if you want to? Um, I think those are really difficult yeah, things so to do. Yeah, so for me, this is currently my work. The reason I'm in Ireland at the moment, of course, to attend this event, but also I'm working with uh, NUIG with the medical students. I'm running 12-week programs for them in mindfulness and compassion-based compassion mindfulness. So we're talking to medical students around how they can train in compassion development so that when they qualify as doctors, they have those resources very powerfully present in their mind. And we're talking about this um, compassion burnout, compassion fatigue. What is that? And to me, that comes when somebody is naturally a very compassionate person, but the stress suffocates the compassion and they become exhausted. And also there's an, out there's a, there, there's an expectation of outcomes. If you are very much grasping at getting an outcome, you're going to feel more and more drained. And so meditation helps you let go of outcomes. So when you're training in meditation, training in compassion development, and letting go of that, kind of it's ego. Letting go of the ego, uh, you can go much further and help more people. I, and I think it's, 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 I want to know how it's going in Galway with the medical students. It's going great. Medicine yeah. is so, I mean, we, we don't like to say it, but it is an incredibly ego-driven profession. You know, we, we, we like being God. doctors. You want to be God. Well, no, I mean, I second in command is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, 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 we like, I think we're, we're drawn to this field because we like studying something complex and difficult and gaining mastery over it and then using that mastery um, to help other people, but it does matter. It really matters. I mean, the outcomes matter to us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's where, where we get stuck. Well, also, just that any, anybody who enters the medical profession will, will be a naturally emp uh, empathetic person, compassionate person, but because it's, it's a very unstable thing, it's not stabilized, it's, it's going to come and go, it, it's, it gets triggered by various situations, uh, it it, there's an expectation of it working and you're doing a good job and you feel let down if you didn't do a good job, the compassion starts to kind of go down. And, right. and what I'm trying to do with the students at NUI Galway is help them to stabilize their compassion by linking it with meditation training. So you're actually building those areas of your brain that are more compassionate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I think the other way to get it I, I, I've, I've found that it's incredibly useful traveling with a monk. <laughs> People really believe you, and you get amazing tables at restaurants. <laughs> Ruby, every, Ruby uses me to get upgrades yeah. on airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I, I will say, for those of you who know Ruby, I mean, travel, you don't get amazing tables at restaurants traveling with Ruby. No. I get them traveling with you. And, and a monk in every doctor's office might be very, uh, might be very helpful. Um, but I wonder, can, should we, can we get questions from the audience? Yeah, right yeah, that, that, that's, let's, hear some, let's hear some comments or questions. Yes? Have you done any studies about these brain changes comparing psychotropic drugs with meditation? I'm just interested in this. You know, there's so many people on psychotropic medications. Yeah, I'm, I'm not... Um, So at, at Yale, there are some research projects that we're doing at the moment on uh, psilocybin for cluster headache, um, but none, none that I know of that are, that are directly comparing meditative experiences with, uh, with, with psychotropic drugs. There was a thing with, when transcendental meditation was big um, that people were comparing those with drug induced, like particularly with LSD. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, know, I don't know if that turned into published literature or just a couple really amazing weekends. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you know, with the, with the development of um, apps and things to help people meditate, I mean, the thing has exploded and gone, gone global. And clearly, where there's commercial interests at hand, I mean, the, 
I sometimes think that the thing has been hyped up in a way that possibly harms uh, people's perception of meditation and um, in terms of its ability to cure and fix all the world's problems. I wondered if you'd comment on that and maybe what you think the limits of uh, meditation are, particularly in the medical world. Mm -hmm. um. So there's a few things in there. So you're talking Turn about apps on the app store for one pound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're talking about the commercialization of mindfulness, yeah. uh, which of course is happening, and that's where we have to be super careful about who is teaching, because there's a whole jumping on the bandwagon thing going on where people see, okay, mindfulness, it's unregulated, so anybody can teach it. So uh, you could jump on the mi uh, on the mindfulness bandwagon, set up your business, make piles of money, but actually be damaging people. Because if you teach mindfulness in a way that's not skillful, you can make somebody worse. So there is a danger there. Um, so I just recommend to people that when they go to a mindfulness class or they listen to a talk on YouTube or something, they really check out who's teaching and how much training they've had and who's taught them and how many retreats have they done. Just like you would, you, you would go to a doctor who's well qualified. Because we all know how easy it is to find a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no problem there. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a difficult problem that you're posing though, Ronan, because if, if you, but, but Tupton, what do you think about in general learning mindfulness through an app well, versus learning it with, a, with of, an in-person? Of course, live teaching is the best way, but I think the thing with apps is that everyone is, in, in a way, addicted to their phone anyway, so you may as well get your phone to do something that's quite <laughs> healthy for you. Um, and it makes it accessible to people who live in remote African villages, or they all have smartphones, but they don't have mindfulness classes on their streets. So it's making it more accessible. But I also worry that people get very addicted to guided meditation. Um, if any of you in this room have done a body scan, it's really easy when you have a nice hypnotic voice saying, now focus on your hands now focus on your head. I mean, you're not actually doing anything, you're just listening to a voice. So you've got to sort of graduate from the guidance, otherwise you're not actually meditating. That's, that's my, my one worry about that. You, you, Tupton said something I thought really memorable to me last night, which is that it's not a, it's not a massage. Again, I realize that sounds really inappropriate in this context, but you know, it's, not, it's not a massage, it's not a relaxation event. It's work. It's work. It's hard work. I, 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 was, I was speaking at a, a, a medical conference in Galway yesterday and I was the last speaker and as I arrived the person on reception said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. You're going to really chill us out at the end of the day, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to make you work. Uh, it's not about just feeling great. If you want to feel great, drink 20 cups of chamomile tea and that will relax you. Meditation is about uh, exploring the nature of consciousness, and that is work, and that is challenging and dangerous. It, it's dangerous unless you're trained well, and unless you, uh, you know, if you, the motivation is very important. It's not just about chilling out, it's, it's more than that. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Yeah? Um, I'm interested in the concept you raised of um, uh, um, effective connectivity. And is there any um, evidence or has there been much research in terms of the senior brain or whether this could be of interest to um, people who study dementia or people who suffer from dementias? Yeah, I, I think it, there, there are two, two, two answers to that from, from my perspective. You, you, I don't know if you know about stuff that's going on in patients with dementia? I don't know about the studies, but I just know that it's helpful. I mean, I can't quote data at you, but I know it's very helpful. So one, one study that I know looked at Zen, med, Zen practitioners compared to age match controls, and there was, there was much less deterioration in the basal ganglia, particularly in the putamen, and that seemed to be associated with the ability to, to, for, to do tonic attention. So if you, uh, have, you have to monitor a certain task on the screen and you monitor it for changes. So that is, uh, there's an age-related decline in the ability to pay prolonged attention to a task which will only infrequently change. And that age-related decline uh, wasn't present in advanced meditators. And it seems to correlate with the preservation of gray matter volume in the putamen. Uh, there's another study 
which there, there's a, there is a study which tried to look at teaching meditative techniques to, pe to patients who have mild cognitive impairment, and that's, um, it's, that's very mixed. But one, one of the real difficulties that I think Tupton and I often talk about is that it's really hard to start doing these techniques at, at a time when you have a problem that you're trying to solve. Mm. It's, the, it's daily practice, mm. and it takes time to build that up. If you start when you already have some cognitive impairment, it's just going to be that much harder mm. to, 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 make, to pay attention. Oh, and I will say that, I mean, you can have cognitive impairment at any point. I mean, cognitive impairment could really just mean like getting into a car crash and now you're in a high anxiety state and you can't make decisions about what, what to do to save, you know, save your child who's trapped in the car. So it could, it could come out of the blue. I mean, I think these are things... Uh, thanks for an amazing talk. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, uh, what the work you're doing in Galway with medical students because um, I think there's a huge crisis in medicine with, uh, I'm in my 50s too, <laughs> and uh, I think doctors and uh, we were in terms, I'm a psychiatrist by the way, a pediatric psychiatrist, but uh, a lot of us have a style attachment in terms of, as well as being slightly uh, arrogant and having godlike complexes, we like to be liked and we want people to like us. And a lot of the empathy about that is we care and we actually do care. And I'm very interested in the idea of compassion fatigue. Mm. And we have no training about how to deal with that. Mm. And I'm so struck in Ireland, and I, I think internationally as well, a lot of my peers in, in every area of medicine are saying to me, I wish I'd never done it. And I think that's an appalling situation. And I think a lot of people are, in, are, are suffering with so-called mental health or mental illness. Uh, we're isolated, and, and going back to your idea of, an, of a web. So I'm very interested in what you're doing in Galway, and if uh, I, I know nothing about um, uh, meditation, except trying in a desert once years ago, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it at all. So I'm very, I'm very in interested. a desert. In a desert, yeah. Okay. In, 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 <laughs> Just in make States. it a little more difficult for yourself. <laughs> That's probably the best way forward, isn't it? That's the way we all go through that. medical school. But I'm really interested. Like, are you looking at outcome measures? Um, are you doing research on it? But I suppose, you know, fundamentally, I think we put the, the brightest uh, young children, and one of my own uh, ch children is going into it now, and I, and I fear for her because she so wants to help people, and she's already going to get fatigue. So yeah. is there evidence, or are you looking at the evidence that's going to change the way we as doctors do it, um, and uh, you know, particularly in, in, in terms of, of, of compassion fatigue? Yeah, so, so this, the course I'm doing in Galway is the second time. It's, it's called a special study module. And it's a 12-week course. We did it last year. Now we're in the middle of the second, second batch. And they are talking about starting to um, do research. At the moment, what they do is they do a 12-week course with me, and then they write a dissertation around how meditation, mindfulness can help in the medical profession and about compassion and burnout. But obviously, r research and evaluation will start to step into the picture soon. Uh, but what I want to pick up on with what you said is this, this need for feedback. So when we do compassion meditation, what we're trying to build is an ability to be compassionate without needing any kind of validation for it. And of course, that's the whole problem when you're trying to help somebody and then they slap you down in some way and then you think, after all I did, did for them, how could they? There's that sort of need for something in return. And that is not compassion, that, that is a kind of grasping. So the whole ethos behind compassion-based mindfulness is to give up grasping and to, to just have this kind of unconditional compassion that grows and grows and gets more and more stable. Yeah. When, when we first met, Tupton asked me to do something which I found surprisingly difficult. He, he, we were sitting around Ruby's kitchen table and he asked us to... Um, I had a very bad relationship with my father and he asked us to... He, said, he, he asked me to forgive my father, to sort of like feel compassion. Well, I told you to, to imagine yourself as him. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, I and I you still nearly can. threw up. I nearly threw up. I mean, I just, I, it, it was really difficult. And I think that um, it's interesting because when you put yourself in a situation where it is the most difficult for you to be compassionate, that's the real test of how you could. Rachel, can you forgive Jeremy Hunt? I mean, if you, could you sort of say, I can imagine myself in Jeremy Hunt's shoes? <laughs> Phone's off. He's like your best friend now. Well, so I met him and spent a good hour and a half talking with him. And I was very surprised because 
he wasn't, it wasn't the excess, it wasn't the ex, ah, oh, there we go, it wasn't the excess of cynicism that shocked me, it was the surfeit of belief, he was this evangelist for his vision of the NHS in a sort of narcissistic degree, and actually, that was, I, I had some compassion yes. for the man because he believed in something that I saw as almost deluded, but he did, and he was desperately trying to fulfil it. So, yeah, I think I may have had compassion for Jeremy Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. No, it's really difficult. But that, that, is, that is the only way we can help somebody to change is if they feel understood. So meeting somebody who you consider to be wrong or a psychopath or whatever, and then you are in their shoes and you see why they do the things they do, and then you can help them. Exactly. Because you've walked in their shoes. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a question about um, sort of consistency in maintaining a meditation practice when your external conditions are... Um, like ill conducive to that. So when I was a medical student, I used to meditate every morning. I found it like really, like really stabilizing, really grounding. Um, then when I um, started working as a junior doctor and intern, um, I was working like 12 hours a day, uh, getting up really early for rounds. I found it really difficult to incorporate, um, incorporate uh, meditation because if I was sleep deprived, that was almost even worse than. Um, then like if just being able to get up and go to work on time and make it make it in time so mm. i find it quite challenging like in terms of um like i, I think you're very vulnerable to compassion fatigue when you're very physically fatigued mm. and it's quite difficult to um to even if you're someone who already is well versed in um your happiness not being dependent on external conditions but to maintain that level of stability when your external conditions are so ill conducive to you being able to meditate can i ask you a question when you were a medical student and you were meditating more diligently, were you meditating with your eyes open or closed? Closed. That's... that's oh, can't believe it. Can't believe it. <laughs> out! Get out! <laughs> I did that. <laughs> so, so, the point is, if you meditate with your eyes closed, it's much harder to then integrate meditation throughout the day. Because what, I totally get what you're saying, you're, you're busy, you have a huge schedule, there's no time to sit and meditate. But what I try to help people learn is to have micro moments of mindfulness throughout their day. So they're bringing that awareness into even working in a busy hospital ward. But if you've got used to meditating with your eyes closed, you start to associate the meditation state with darkness only because when your eyes are closed, it's dark. So you, it, much, it becomes much harder to integrate the practice throughout the day. So I, when I train people, I get them from day one to meditate with their eyes open so that they're learning to associate the meditation state with ordinary daily experience, and then it can integrate more throughout the day. So that might be a good solution, is to, is to revisit the daily practice and do maybe five minutes with the eyes open every day and then learn how to bring that energy into tiny moments throughout your day. Should we, should we do it? Yes, Should definitely. we do the thing? Yeah, do you want, do, do you do want to thing. quickly ask a question, Mark? I had a, real, I had a real quick question. Uh, it seems like usually when we study this, we take rookies and try to teach them some basics and see how they do. But aren't there sort of very high-end practitioners who can do or tolerate things much more than the average person? Couldn't we study people who are at the very top of the meditative practice well, and do. see what they So a lot, a lot of those studies looked at people that were you know, doing, doing meditation for 20, 30 years and, and more. They did. The, the trouble, as I said, is that you don't know like, the, the kind of person that chooses to wear the saffron robes might be different than, than the kind of person who doesn't. So comparing those they, two groups is tough. They have done uh, research on very, very advanced meditators, but to me, I, I don't find that interesting enough because no, it's not relatable. I, I get excited when you say somebody did five days of meditation right. and there yeah. was a brain change because yeah. that's going to make the ordinary person on the street do it. If you say, oh, well, we, we tested a monk who's been in retreat for 30 years, you're going to think, well, <laughs> so what? Sounds <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of things that are weird about that guy. <laughs> 
Yeah. Let's do some meditation. Let's, let's do it. Okay, so um, sit up nice and straight in your chairs. And when I'm talking about the eyes, I'm saying leave your eyes open but not looking around the room. You're just looking downwards in front of you into the space in front of you, kind of that far away from your face, sort of uh, you're not focused on anything. Your eyes are softened and kind of switched off but left open. So spend a moment, first of all, establishing the wish to benefit yourself and benefit others. This is the compassion phase. Just create that intention very strongly in your mind. And now focus on your body. Feel the chair underneath you. Just feel the chair through your body. You can feel it under you and behind you. Bring your attention to your hands and feel them resting in your lap. And bring your focus to your shoulders. Just notice any tension, but don't push it away. Don't judge it. Just be present with whatever is happening. Now try to find your breathing. Don't breathe differently or deeply. Just leave it very natural. But find where in your body you can feel the breathing is happening. Is it your chest, your belly, your nose, your mouth? Where do you feel it? Just focus your attention on that movement of breath. Within moments, you'll find your mind has drifted, and that's where you just gently capture the attention and bring it back to the breath again and again. Try to feel the air coming in and out of the end of your nose or your mouth and really experience the air brushing across the skin at the edge of your nostrils or your lips. And when your mind gets distracted, bring it back to that very precise focus. We're just going to do another 30 seconds. mind drifts and then you return again and again. Okay, now relax back into the body, feel the chair under you. Experience the sensation of your feet touching the floor, feel the ground under your feet. And then end by making a strong commitment around compassion to yourself and compassion to others. Develop that strong intention to practice meditation for your own benefit and the benefit of the world around you. And stop there. It's not an instant hit. <laughs> Just like lifting weights, you don't get muscles after three repetitions. 
But if you did that for five minutes every day, it accumulates. And as Ash said, after five days, your brain is different. Yeah. It works. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys.